us tonight, amen. And um, I didn't welcome our visitors, so thank you, visitors, for being here. It's good to have you. If you're a first time visitor, Gina, introduce your guest over there. Mike, God bless you, sir. Glad you're here. Amen. Make sure he gets a visitor's card and feels it. Is anybody else visiting for the very first time tonight? Anybody else? All right. I'm glad you're here. It's good to have you. Are you in 2 Corinthians 4? 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Um, 2 Corinthians, actually, we'll look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and chapter number 5, a little bit of it tonight. But in looking at uh, things that are happening, I appreciate you praying for my wife. My wife has just had uh, rotator cuff surgery, and I know that might be minor to a lot of things going on in our church as far as health. Pardon? Well, uh, yeah, I'm not being careful, but it's, uh, she is doing good. Thank you for praying for her. Amen. I appreciate that. And for those of you going through trials and disappointments, I know this will help you. We've got to get focused. I think, Brother Paul, what did you, uh, you preach on this morning, Sunday School? Perspective, right perspective? Oh, last night's prayer meeting. And I like that perspective, focused. Your perspective. Uh, we need to get in the Bible, get our Bible convictions, a right focus, right perspective on things. It's sad to say that a lot of people are letting their conscience be their standard, amen, their guide. And it's not. The Word of God is your standard. The conscience will enforce that if you have a right conscience, if you have a good conscience. But I know that life is full of, uh, full of problems, full of trials, and full of trouble, discouragements. A lot of things goes on in a person's life. Sometimes I don't know all about them. Sometimes I do in my congregation, and I sure pray for you. But I do know what the Bible says over in the book of Job, chapter 14, verse number 1. It says, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. And that has proven to be true. That has proven to be true And just... Uh, the short span of my life, there's a lot of trials, a lot of disappointments. But that doesn't give me a reason to quit. We don't want to lose, lose, lose hope, lose focus, get our eyes off the, off the Word of God and, all, and our perspective in life. In Second, uh, Second Timothy chapter 3, verse number 12, the Bible says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, shall, didn't say it would, I mean, or maybe, it said shall suffer persecution. I like this one too. I'm going to, believe it or not, 2 Corinthians 4 and 5, but I got a few more verses. You know how I get. You know, I get on these. Lamentations, chapter 5, verse number 5 says, Our necks, our necks are under persecution. We labor and have no rest. That's, that's true, isn't it? Um, if we look back at life, I sure appreciate those mountaintops when they come, though. Amen. Um, a lot of valleys, but that's where you learn your lessons in the valleys. Well, I've learned some good lessons on the mountaintop too. And uh, but, what did the psalmist say? It's good for me that I've been afflicted, that I may learn thy statutes. That's really when we get in the Word of God. When when we afflictions and trials come, the Bible says too in um, Matthew chapter thirteen. I am going to Second Corinthians four. Matthew chapter thirteen, verse twenty one. Speaking of uh, one individual out of four types of individuals, it says in verse 21, Yet he hath not rooted himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He's offended. And uh, gets offended and he quits. Did you know that church is about the only thing I think of you can quit when you get offended? You know, you don't quit your job because you get offended. Isn't that something? You don't, do you? You don't quit your job. You get that paycheck every week, every Friday. And you get offended on your job, you stay with it anyway. But now you let somebody get offended in church and they're gone. They just leave. Throw in the towel. Um, let me read another one to you. Because of persecution. Offended. The world's getting offended. What was it? Uh, I was telling my wife today. My little grandson's over there, and I got the prettiest little granddaughter, Lillian, and my daughter Sarah's over there taking care of her mama. But uh, what we do to offend, we were, my uh, grandson took the vacuum cleaner. I don't know how boys do it. I mean, he's a five-year-old boy, but he took the, he took the vacuum cleaner, and he, 
he took the nozzle off and disconnected the, the brush and, you know, the, the handle. And in other words, he made a gun out of it. I don't know how he did it. But he goes, he popped it, and he said, Papa, I just shot you. You're dead. So I had to play dead. <laughs> but now I looked at my wife and smiled. She said, what are you smiling about? And I said, if he'd have done that in school, that would that, 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 uh, run him off. Fella made, who, who was it made a paper gun in school, and they, they uh, what do they call it uh, when they send you up? Expelled. Expelled, yeah, expelled. Expelled him. I said, they expelled my boy. Now, you know, I grew up doing things like that, and it produced a lot healthier individuals than what they're producing today, I guarantee it. Hey, Amen. we played cowboys and Indians and everything. How did I get off on that offended? <laughs> my grandson. I guarantee you, if you have grandbabies, you'll always find a way to talk about them. You, you always will. You'll find a way to talk about them. Uh, I'm on offended, quitting. Let me give you another one here. Mark uh, chapter 4, verse 17, same thing. It's Matthew 13 was talking about. Have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Um, people just quit too soon. I've asked people that's come in here, Come in my church over the years. I said, if you'll just stay, I don't know why I said three months. And I said, just stay three months. Because I know that you're going to hear something that's going to offend you. Uh, some fellows over here that's come in Bible study, you ought to see the looks on their face when we start teaching sometimes. I've never heard that. And so tell me what you've heard. Uh, and it's, it's inevitable offense. You see, I was raised uh, uh, with a charismatic background. And... Um, Anyway, I, I got in the Word of God and I found out some things that I believed when I was a child just didn't, didn't correspond with the Bible. And I was talking, I was talking to a lady and I said, I said uh, her name was Miss Callie. I said, Callie, that's, that's, that's not in the Bible. She said, oh, yes, it is. I said, no, ma'am, it's not. I said, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not an authority. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm not an expert authority. I said, but I'm an authority enough to know that I've read the Bible several times, and that's just not in there. Well, she said, I know it is. I've read it somewhere. Anyway, we went on like that for all. Anyway, where she thought it was, I turned, and it wasn't there, and we turned, and finally we, we, just, we concluded it's not in the Bible. She concluded it's not in the Bible. You know what she told me? She got mad at me. And it was over a, it was over a charismatic issue. It was over something that, that had been taught all the life, and it wasn't true. A lot of things I've been taught just wasn't true, and a lot of things you've been taught is not true. Now, if I say that from the pulpit, you're liable to get mad at me. You might get offended. But if it's not in there, why don't you just believe the book? Why don't you believe it? And you know what she finally did? J.W., she looked at me, and she said, she said, I don't care what that says. I know how I feel. So she was offended. She, she's offended. And, and when you start talking about See, I can and I can speak with, with, with some authority on that, on, on some beliefs of Armenian beliefs, because I was in it. And uh, I had my brother went to a church up in Chattanooga, and I said, John, you don't want to go up there. I said, I know what they believe. No, David, you don't know what they believe. I said, John, I do. That's my brother. I can argue with him. And uh, and he, you know, if he gets mad at me, big deal. He'll get over it in a day or two. But. I said, no, that's not what they believe. He said, yes, it is. And it's a good church, and they love me. I said, I want you to promise me something. All right, I'll promise you something. What do you? I said, go to that pastor and ask him if what I'm saying is not true. He said, he don't believe I've heard him preach. I said, go to that pastor and ask him. You know what the issue was? If a man could lose her salvation. I said, go to that. I said, I know what he believes. I, know. I said, if he didn't believe like that, he'd take the name off his building. I said, go to that preacher and see what he believes. And so he took me up on it. And um, anyway, as a result, today he's in a Baptist church. But it doesn't make Baptist right either, just because he's in a Baptist church. But he went to the preacher of this particular church he's going to now and said, can a man lose his salvation? The preacher said, no, there ain't no way. Not according to the scripture, a man can't lose his salvation if he's really saved. And that's a true statement. I can prove that by the Bible. So if I, it's inevitable, though, when you preach that you, you, you will, the word will offend. But why, why quit if, if why, why get mad and quit and throw in the towel 
if, if God said it. You, you're, not, you're not really, you can, you can say you're arguing me, and that preacher's, and it, you know, people say, well, that preacher's got his own interpretation. Yeah. Well, it's, if, if the Bible said I'm sealed to the day of redemption, meaning bodily redemption, what does he mean when he says that? How do you, how do you twist it? How, how, do you, how do you twist it? Ephesians 4.30. Uh, how, how do you twist uh, 1 Peter when it says, I have a place reserved in heaven kept by the power of God? Kept by the power of God. You can't twist words like that. You just can't do it. Well, anyway, so offense. And he didn't quit. Thank God my brother didn't quit. He, he said, all right, if that's truth, I want to find truth. I want to find out what truth is. So he found out what truth is. All right, so there's no reason to quit. And even, even Christians, I'm talking about those that, that, have, that have claimed to be born again, it's made a, made a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, realizing that he's sufficient, that Christ is sufficient. And God's satisfied with what Christ done. I mean, people that's really born again, really saved, uh, Christians can get perplexed sometimes. That's our favorite word at my house. When we don't know what's wrong, we got one of, them, one of them crazy feelings, you know. You don't know what's wrong with you or nothing. Are you sick? No. Well, what's wrong? I don't know. We got a word for that. We, we call it perplexed. So anytime you hear me say I'm perplexed, I really don't know what's wrong with me. So Christians can get perplexed. They can get, they can get distraught. And did you know they can even want to quit? I used, to, I used to listen to pastors when I was a young preacher back uh, years ago. And, and they'd get behind the pulpit and they'd thunder out, I've never wanted to quit. And I thought, well, bless God, I don't either. And then after about 20 years in the ministry, uh, I remember that preacher thundering out, I never wanted to quit. I, I, I don't know. Either I'm weaker than I thought I was or he was a liar. I didn't know which one. Now, is, I'm sure that all of you Christians that are here knows you're saved. You've never wanted to just throw in the towel. Never have, have you? Sure you have. Sure you have. But we don't quit. We don't, why? Because a Christian is too easy to quit. It's too, you know, people giving up on marriages and everything else. If you don't get along, let's just quit. You know, there... Somebody said, how in the world do you stay together? And I heard this from another preacher. Is that, I'll tell you how we stayed together is we purposed in our heart that we wasn't going to leave. We, we were going to stay with all the troubles and all the trials, everything going on. We purposed in our heart that we, we was going to stay. Uh, you've heard the, you know, people are quitting marriages, quitting church. They said the grass is greener on the other side. Well, have you been to the other side? It's artificial turf. Yeah. Over a septic tank. Water the grass. That's, I like that. It's amazing what will happen if you water the grass on your side. That's, that is well said, isn't it? Amen. So don't, don't quit. Don't quit. And the reason we don't quit, let me take a few minutes to tell you why we don't quit. Um, you, might, you might have one reason you want to quit, but I guarantee there's plenty of reasons why you shouldn't. Plenty of reasons why you shouldn't. You should stay true to the Word of God. Be faithful to the Word of God. Be faithful to the church. Be faithful to your family. Is First of all, we have a glorious, glorious ministry. Chapter 4. I told you I was getting there. Therefore, therefore, Seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in the craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. We have a glorious ministry, and this glorious ministry that we have brings, of course, new, uh, new life. It brings salvation and righteousness. And by the way, it's all, it's described over here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. If you'll notice verse number 8 of chapter 3, this glorious ministry. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Well, look at verse 7.
But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, if the law was glorious, and what does the law do? What is the law supposed to do? Bring you to Christ. But what, what is the law? So the law is a schoolmaster. And it brings you to Christ. And so the law tells us that we don't measure up. That's it. We don't measure up. We can't. If, if we depended on the law and ourselves to get to heaven, I guarantee you there wouldn't be one soul in heaven. Not one soul. One soul. Because the law was never designed to take anybody to heaven. Romans chapter 3 verse 20. The law was, God gave the law. And by the way, it's a glorious law. Isn't that what it says? Isn't it a glorious law? It's a glorious law. In that, it does what it's supposed to do. Brings you to the point that you say, there's nothing good in me, and there's no way that I could ever measure up to God's morals and standards. God's got his standards written here, and I just don't measure up. All right, now the Bible said it's engraved in stone. It was glorious. So that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, ministration of condemnation, what's that ministration? What's the ministration of condemnation? The law. The law, the ministration of condemnation. The law says we're condemned. The law does not say try to be good. The law says do or to be good. No exceptions. Now, if the ministration, verse 9, of condemnation be glory, much more that the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. And then, uh, for even that which was made glorious, verse 10, had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. Oh, let me go on down here to what? Verse, uh, verse 14. Verse, verse 14. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil, and taken away the reading of the Old Testament, which the veil is done away with in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it, the heart shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, that was a point of controversy here not too long ago. It wasn't controversy. It was just, just stating some facts. When, when was the veil taken away? In Christ. There's no doubt about it. No, I don't think anybody could argue that. But I, I do believe this. I believe that that hearts are still darkened, minds are still darkened, and in your mind, you need your mind renewed, therefore therefore that darkness is there. And that darkness is there until, according to uh, verse 3 of chapter 4, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. And when you reject truth, by the way, the darkness gets even, can darkness get more dark? Thank you. All right. I'm trying to say it right, though, in English. Darkness gets darker. Is that acceptable? Okay, thank you. In whom the God of this world is blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And then verse 6, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. When did God command the light to shine out of darkness? In creation. Genesis, back in Genesis chapter 1. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. The same, the same God shined in our hearts, our minds, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So we have a ministry. I don't want to quit. I don't want to quit because I have a glorious ministry. That ministry that's committed unto me, and by the way, it's um, uh, according to Strong's, that word ministry means something to attend to or an official service. So I have something I need to attend to, as my grandma used to say. I need to attend to it. I have a, an official service, and that is proclaiming the gospel of Christ. Not arguing scripture with everybody, but proclaiming the gospel of Christ. That's what I need to attend to, and I don't want to quit because that's committed to me. It's committed to every child of God. Amen. And this glorious ministry, 
brings life and salvation and righteousness that was described there in 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. Now, the message we preach is able to transform lives. What's the message? The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. This glorious ministry, the gospel. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is a power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is revealed, what? That the, in the gospel is revealed the righteousness of God. And you know, if you've read the Bible, that a person has to have the righteousness of God imputed to him before he can go to heaven. So we just preach the gospel. That, I don't want to quit because I'm, you know what? Yeah, and, and, and even when it crosses my mind, just to, yeah, somebody will get saved. And a, man, I'll just, in other words, that, that being perplexed just leaves and that brightens up. And, I, and I, don't, I don't need somebody to get saved every day. But every once in a while, you just need to see it, don't you? You just need to see somebody get a hold of truth. And when they get a hold of truth and, and, and rest in the finished work of Christ and, and, and then begin to, begin to testify how, they've, how they're trusting Christ and how they're going to heaven, I don't want to quit. I don't want to quit. The message we preach is able to transform lives. And this ministry is a gift given by God because of His mercy, not anything that we have done. It's all according to His mercy. Now, I don't know how far I'm going to get, but there's several reasons right here in 2 Corinthians why we don't want to quit. But turn over to um, 1, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. This ministry that we have is a gift given by God because of His mercy, not anything that we've done. 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that He counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Have you, have you stopped? Child of God, did you know that you're in the ministry as far as Romans 10, how beautiful are the feet of them that bring good tidings, that, that preach good tidings, glad tidings. Did you know that every child of God is supposed to proclaim truth? You might not be in a formal environment as far as being a pastor or, or, or according to Ephesians 4, an evangelist or teacher, but it's, it's your responsibility, it's your ministry to proclaim the gospel. And uh, I know Paul's writing here, but you ought to thank God every day. When's the last time that you just... Thank God for putting you in the ministry, especially you pastors and preachers. I'm so thankful that he put me into the ministry. And Paul said, before I was a blasphemer, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did, it in, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. And by the way, here's li what kind of life? It's not partial life. It's all through the scripture, it's everlasting life. Everlasting means everlasting. Eternal means eternal. It's not partial. Salvation does not depend or on, on, it's not merited on my works. I don't, I don't merit God's salvation. I don't merit heaven because of Christ and Christ Jesus alone. Verse 17, now unto the king eternally, mortal, invisible, the only wise God be honor and glory forever. Amen. While we're on mercy, just for a minute, go over to Titus. I'm going to jump, jump off the message here just for a moment. Titus chapter 3. Now, again, the ministry is given to us. Not anything we've done. It's all because of the mercy of God. Salvation is all because of the mercy of God. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. Um, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. God's salvation is not based on our own good works, nor are our own good works now the cause of our salvation. 
If a person could be saved by good works, then there would have been no need at all for a Savior. You see, it's a fundamental principle of the gospel that the good works of men have no place in the justification of the soul. Good works of men have never, never, never caused God to consider, pardon, or receive anyone to himself. The only basis of justification is the merit of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, God's mercy put everything into motion. Isn't that something? Isn't that good? It's by His mercy. All right, we have a ministry. This ministry keeps us from quitting. If you'll notice back in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not. We don't quit. We stay true. It keeps us from quitting. And according to chapter number 4 and verse 2, 3, and 4, especially verse 2, this glorious ministry keeps us from being a deceiver. If you'll notice verse 2, Paul said, I have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Did you know, did you know the Bible speaks of people, and I've seen people, and you have too if you've turned on your television set, not everyone on television, but that, that use this book right here deceitfully for gain. Just use it for gain. Paul said, I don't want to do that. And this ministry keeps me from being a quitter. I don't want to quit. I don't faint. I don't want to faint. This ministry keeps us honest, keeps from being us being a deceiver. And this precious ministry that you and I have, it keeps us from being self-promoters. I was talking to somebody today and they said, I don't ask for a certain thing because it's, I don't want people to think that I'm asking for myself. And I thought that was a good statement. You'd have to, I'm not going to give you the context, but I knew exactly where he was coming from. He didn't want to promote himself. And we're not to be self-promoters. Verse number 5 and 6, the Bible said, For we preach not ourselves, but... Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Uh, this ministry that you and I have, it keeps us from being self-promoters. A lot of people like to glory in their achievements. Let me read to you. Let me read to you Proverbs. Pro I love the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 25, verse number 27. Um, now, if I had my way with it, I'd take this part out of the Bible. It said it's not good to eat much honey. But it's in there. I make oatmeal, you know, and trying to be healthy. And I don't put white sugar in it anymore because everybody tells me that's bad for me. They tell me it is. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I had open heart surgery and they told me to quit a lot of things, so I started quitting them, you know. And I don't eat a lot of white sugar anymore. So I dump honey in my oatmeal. And I look at that little bear, you know, you get, a, you get honey in a bear. And I start squeezing that honey and I'm thinking to myself, I'd like to put that whole bottle in here. But you know what comes to my mind every time I do that? It's not good to eat much honey. <laughs> but the, I'm going to get to the last part of this verse. So for men to search their own glory is not glory. Now, you go ahead and toot your horn all you want to because that's all the glory you're going to get. That's it. The Bible says it's not good for man to search their own glory because when he does that, it's really not glory, is it? Well, Paul knew that the treasure within the vessel gave the vessel its value. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? Look at, uh, look at verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels and that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. I don't want to quit. You don't want to quit because we have such a wonderful ministry. And what this ministry entails, what it, what it just, what, just, what, just what the ministry that God has given us at Faith Baptist Church. You, 
just, just at Faith Baptist Church. We have the City of Refuge. We have the Second Chance Ministry. You have a radio ministry. You have a, you have a, you have a Bible college. You've got areas, helping hands. You've got, name some more. Prisons, nursing homes, radio. Visitation, bus ministry, nursery, choir, <laughs> thank you. Every, every, yes, sir, and Sunday school. Everything, and, and every Sunday, I don't believe the Lord's let us go a Sunday in a long, long, long time without seeing somebody new and their face come, I mean, new. And we haven't went, we, we, it hasn't been long that, that somebody will stand up like, like, like um, Kevin over here and, and turn right around and tell everybody that he's trusted Christ as his Savior. Charlie, Lord, have mercy. If you'd have known Charlie, you'd, you'd have thrown him away a long time ago. Charlie is... Uh, Charlie's a fellow... There was a there was a fella said, Charlie, Charlie's in church. I said, Yeah, Charlie's in church. I'm not gonna say what else he said. <laughs> but why why would I want to quit? Why why would I want to quit when I see people like Charlie and people like Kevin and and uh, let me you know I I look at this I look at this bad lot over here. But let's look over here for a minute. Let's look at one just as bad. Miss Beverly Donnell. Miss Beverly Donnell. And I and I and when she got up and gave her testimony the other day, it flowed like water. It wasn't manufactured. Is is this ministry work? Why would I want to quit when I see things like this? Why would I want to quit when people get saved? You don't want to quit. If you got it in your mind to quit, you better change your mind tonight. <laughs> and just thank God for everything you do have. Amen. All right. We are not going to quit. Let's stand to our feet. Because we're going to eat ice cream. We're not going to quit. White sugar and all. <laughs> Amen. Amen. What a blessing this church is. Amen. Thank you for being here. And as we're dismissed in prayer, Brother Todd, pray for us. And when you pray, will you ask God to bless all the festivities and food too? Thank you, sir.